Scott, I thank you for joining us for today's presentation on HomeFit, Making Your Home Safe and Livable with guest presenter from the Lisa Ann Roosh Burn Foundation on tips for burn safety. Um, I'm going to introduce our lovely speakers now and we'll get started with the program. So we're so excited to have two amazing volunteer presenters share some highlights about how to make your home safe and livable. Um, Fritzi Grodeon is the Director of Education and Advocacy at Age Safe America and the CEO of Household Guardians Incorporated. She is absolutely amazing, brings such a wealth of expertise. She specializes in senior move management, environmental consulting, aging in place, home safety and modification. She also teaches aging in place and universal design courses. Um, she's also been a longtime AARP volunteer and we are so grateful to have her. And hopefully you all have been learning so much from her from all the different programs she's been doing with us. Additionally, um, we have a representative from the Elisa Ann Rouge Burn Foundation, which in case you may not have heard about them, they spent about 50 years of our working for fire and burn safety and service to the burn survivor community. Their mission is to significantly reduce the number of burn injuries through prevention education and to enhance the quality of life of those affected by burn injuries here in California. So they do a lot of safety and prevention education programs just like we do, but they've partnered with us today to give you some additional tips and tricks um, and things to look out for. So we're absolutely delighted to have Andrew Mersman here, who is an author and media consultant, as well as a proud longtime volunteer camp counselor and former board member for the Elisa Ann Roosh Burn Foundation. He's a writer um, and co-creator of the Burn Education materials and programs, including SPARK, which is the Senior Prevention and Risk Conversations specifically focused on fire safety and burn prevention as we age. If you all could give a great um, virtual round of applause for our speakers, <laughs> and I'll go ahead and pass it to them for the presentation today. Thank you everyone for being here. All righty, thank you, Tiffany, for the rousing introduction. Um, I can always count on you to make all of us as presenters feel comfortable as well. Uh, so welcome to HomeFit, making your home safe and livable for all. With uh, partnered with Andrew Mersman, and we're going to share our time together with you, talking about the home um, opportunities to make it safer. And here we go. So the Home Fit Guide prepared by AARP, this is a picture of the cover and it, uh, you will have the resource link to make sure that you get hold of the Home Fit Guide if you don't already have one. So we are gonna talk about uh, some universal design, take a brief tour through the house. And as we go, Andrew will also be supplying us with important information um, throughout the house. So what's the first thing that you think of when you hear the word home? This is a chance to put it. What do you think of? Put it in the chat. And our team will share those answers with us. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the word home? Safety, comfort. I can see a few of those, Diane, do we have others? Relaxing. Yeah, a couple comfort. Accessible from the vertex. Yeah. And Teresa says family, Natalie yeah. says where I hang out. Of course you're from Hawaii, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Right, so I, I will tell you that pets. what oh pets. pets okay we're not we're not going to go we're not going to talk about pets today directly but they absolutely are an important part of our home but it's very interesting because so for my, so many of us we think of our homes as that safe place and the whole perspective on what safety means can include all of these different things as well family and pets and comfort and security. So we're going to take a look at some ways to keep it all safe for us. 
Universal design is where we're going to start. And universal design is one of the five categories of design developed I, now truly 40 years ago to really make very clear the design concepts so that everyone, all ages and abilities has access to the home and to the accommodations inside the home. So regardless of size, shape, ability, disability, age, we all wanna have access to that safe place that is our home. And universal design gives us a way to frame what those accommodations may look like for us. <clears throat> All righty, what do you think about this image? Pop your answers in chat for this one. I know I saw a very disapproving nod from Karen, so you already know. <laughs> okay. It's not a good picture. It's not a good picture. Out of breath. Absolutely. Yeah. Ugh. Yes, absolutely. And here, um, and Tiffany knows, when the, my first reaction when I saw this was Rocky, right? Standing at the top of the stairs in Philadelphia, but he had been training over and over to get up those stairs, right? Most of us don't go into training just to get into our own homes. And so, the same thing, we don't expect our visitors and our friends or family to be in training either to get into our homes. So we will start with the exterior, uh, talking about ways now, remember this is our exteriors, we wanna consider whether it's a house or an apartment. We still need to be able to get in and out safely. So what would be ideal for us is at least one zero step entrance. And it doesn't have to be the front door, a side door, back door, even in through the garage perhaps, as a way to be able to get in without having to go up a step. So there it is, zero step entrances, uh, one of those pieces of the universal design. And in this rendering, we see a gentle walkway up to a front door. So in this case, there isn't a specific ramp that takes us up there, but we have integrated the walkway into the design with some lighting, with the plantings to be able to get into the home easily. And if we think about looking at zero step entrances, it is not simply because someone may be in a wheelchair or using an assistive device. If you're the little one in a stroller, you must be so much happier that somebody can roll you up to the front door in that stroller instead of dragging that stroller backwards, bump, bump, bump up the stairs. So as we look at this, we're looking at it for ourselves and being able to stay in our homes for as long as possible. But remembering that there are lots of generations for, of us for whom this kind of an entrance would really work well. The other person to keep in mind is the person who's gonna be delivering the new washing machine, right? That new washing machine doesn't wanna go up the stairs either and get easily into your house. Another way to make our steps easier may be the longer tread stairs, so that instead of doing a ramp up to the front of the house, if we can extend the stairs so that each stair gives us a little further distance to travel before we take the step up. So here they're called the walker stairs. They're a little shallower, but they do allow us to roll if we need to, and then just go up one step at a time and continue into the house as easily as possible. Key points for us here, and I forgot from slide one, sorry. 
watch for the green stars. Green stars are quick tips. So luckily on this slide, we have two, which was my reminder. These are easy to do, easy to implement ideas. And these are good places to take notes and see that there are some things that we can do quickly and easily. All right, that's the green stars for our quick tips. Also on our exteriors, having lighting is absolutely important. And not only lighting that goes on with a switch, maybe inside or outside, but additional lighting. So we want lighting, if we can, consider even motion sensor lights focused over the lock itself. So as we approach, we'll have a light right on that door handle. And here for safety as well, we've got the large house numbers, easy to see in a contrast against the surface of the house. Now, I will tell you that I have seen the silver reflective house numbers sometimes, and people think they're easy to see, but if the silver numbers are against a pastel house or a beige house, they really disappear. So I encourage you to have the darker numbers on the light surface or white numbers on a dark surface. We want to be able to be found in case there's an emergency or we want our friends and neighbors to be able to find us too. This picture also has the a video doorbell. So many people are incorporating those as well to be able to know who is at the door before they get there. The levered style door handle on the slide is one that is easy to operate. A universal design component is called low physical effort. So it's fancy words that mean it's easier to use. You can lift it up, you can push it down and it will unlatch the door. You can do it with your elbow, and I have had people put into chat that the dog has even learned how to unlatch the door with the levered handle. So at this point, we have looked a little bit at the outside and Andrew, are there suggestions from your Spark program that would uh, come into play here with us? There absolutely are, Fritzi. Thank you so much. It's um... As I'm gonna sort of pipe up from the peanut gallery with some ideas through a fire and burn safety lens, there are areas all over the house that these things come up. And, and so it's sort of a perfect fit. I love this home fit presentation all the time because we're just looking around the house. Here it is Friday, we're starting a weekend. My honeydew list is so long of so many things that I need to do around the house. Some of them can make my house safer. And my house doesn't have to be unsafe to make my house safer. And I think that's super important to remember mm. that we're not sort of doing disaster mitigation. We're just looking for ways, hacks of making our life a little easier. So when we think about the exterior, Fritzi, you talked about all these amazing ways that we talk about getting into our home, which is so important. But from my perspective, I also want to make sure we think about how to get out of our home safely mm -hmm. in an emergency. So ideally, we want to know two ways out of each room, not just the house in general, but each room. Most often that's a door and a window because we wanna do that thinking ahead of time before the panic of a possible emergency comes up. If it's the window, firefighters and rescue workers can help you out if the doorway is blocked by fire, but you just wanna make sure that you know ahead of time two safe ways to get out of every room in your house. And that's my one big note for, uh, for exterior stuff. Great, thank you, thank you. It's, um, that's, and um, I'm going to tag on to Andrew's comment think about what happens when you get out once you get out that window what is that surface and is there a pathway that would allow you to walk around many of us in southern california have gravel around our homes and zero scape land and zero scape landscaping so andrew's points are very well taken know how to get out but also just take a minute and see what happens if you were to go out and can you in fact then move away from the structure if there is a, an emergency. The smart home, <laughs> using technology to improve our lifestyle. So any of you already have smart home features in your home? 
We just saw on the previous slide the ring doorbell. Diane, anybody in chat? Oh, here's actually a smart poll. You got it. Thank you. You got it, uh, Karen. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, All righty. Smart features in your home, yes or no? Uh, not sure. Some days that's how I feel. And um, then what are your thoughts about adding some smart home features? All righty. I'm going to answer for myself here. And I'd like to learn more. There we go. How does it look on our results? Wow, okay. We've got about a third. Yeah, not sure. I, I was there for a long time. <laughs> ah, and we're kind of evenly split on like them or considering them. Good. And Good. I, I noticed there are more no answers than yes. For that we are concerns. Um, that we currently are not taking advantage of the smart home features. All right, well, let's take a look at a few of them and see if there are ways that we can incorporate those as well. So in our homes, uh, as one of the examples is the virtual home assistant. And I'm gonna just pop this off here, uh, is the virtual home assistant. And they come in different brands um, where the location from which I am speaking today, I can actually say their names out loud. Sometimes when I'm speaking, I can't say their names because they talk back. But having a virtual home assistant can in fact provide some very valuable services to us by with a full system, adjusting the thermostat, locking and unlocking the doors, certainly in terms of our environmental side, playing music, providing reminders to us uh, for any number of reasons. But the other piece of the smart home is not just what the virtual home assistants are doing, but the other kinds of systems. So we saw the ring doorbell system, which is a, a different form of a security system and is a different piece of important safety for us. So that's one kind of an option. And there are other systems that manage lighting throughout the house or even just plugs so that you can turn lights on and off if you are away from home or on vacation or you'd like to have the light on when you enter the house. So there's lots of different ways that some of these smart home features can be included. So I do recommend considering it. It depends truly. I mean, for many of them, you do have to have an internet connection. So there's that one requirement. But sometimes just having one or two pieces allows us to have some flexibility in terms of, especially on the lighting and the security side. So Andrew, are there smart home tips for folks too? Yeah, one of the things that I think about about technology around our home is kind of the old school smart home, which is a, oh, I got to hold it in front of me, a smoke alarm. Um, it's something that's required in all new construction. Hopefully you consider it required in older construction, apartment, home, uh, shared house or shared environment, doesn't matter. They are required to be in your home. Many of them these days are hardwired. So a lot of them are battery operated. It's hard these days to even find the ones with a little rectangular nine volt battery anymore because almost all new ones for the last seven or eight years are 10 year batteries. But you still want to make sure, even if it's hardwired, there's probably a backup battery mm -hmm. as well, because if your power goes out, you don't want this safety feature to go out. You still want to have the safety feature of a smoke alarm. Uh, their building code throughout the United States requires one in or just outside each sleeping space, sleeping room, at least one on every floor of your home. 
and one near the kitchen that hopefully you don't disconnect. Even when you burn the chicken and the thing's beeping and you take it down or you're swatting at it and opening the windows, make sure that as soon as dinner's over, you get that thing hooked back up again before you go to bed. Um, and you just wanna make sure that you test them. There's always some kind of a test button. I'm not gonna do it right now because it'll hurt all of our ears, but there, you wanna make sure that you test them regularly. Even the hardwired ones, you wanna make sure that you're testing to make sure mm -hmm. that they work. A lot of people also have combo smoke alarm and carbon monoxide detectors. They might have a voice that says fire, 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 or carbon mm -hmm. monoxide detected. They might just be the beeps that we all know and we recognize. And there's also some great inventions for folks who are hard of hearing or hearing impaired. There are ones that are connected to a strobe light. There are ones that have a lower tone that are a little more vibrational that might wake you from sleep. And then there's also something that connects wirelessly to smoke alarms in your home called a thumper or a shaker. And there's mm -hmm. a piece that you put under your pillow or your mattress, and it will in fact vibrate your bed if there's an emergency and smoke is detected. So that's the uh, old school, the OG uh, smart home device. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. And actually on the newer smart home for people who have multi-story homes or homes with basements, there are ways now to connect them so that if you're sleeping on the second floor of a home, but a fire were to start in the basement, there are systems now where a smoke alarm will actually activate all of them in the house. Uh, it doesn't matter where the fire or smoke is detected. So it is um, some, there are some other important changes, especially for multi-story homes too. Great suggestions. All righty, let's do like Natalie's. <laughs> well, Someone to speak to if you <laughs> live alone. <laughs> right. That was cute, Natalie. <laughs> yeah, yes. Except when the somebody you speak to talks back, then you go. Okay. All righty, let's look at our entry spaces um, as well. Oftentimes our doors do present a challenge. The width of the doorways, um, most of the time now code is 36 inch wide entrance doors. But besides just our entryway, we have some interior doors as well. So if there are interior doors that will in, are to make the doorway itself too narrow, this swing away hinge or swing clear hinge is a way to pick up some space because it moves the door completely out of the way, provided you have the wall or hallway space to have that happen. But it could be an important addition and a relatively simple one to do that would provide that safer access in and out of the smaller spaces. And while you're looking at the wide, the width of the doors, check the thresholds too. This is my fall safety tip, right? Look at the thresholds and make sure that you don't have a tripping hazard right at that doorway. So the threshold needs to be about a quarter of an inch or less, a smooth transition. If it's a half an inch or taller, then you may want to look at a simple bevel to make that transition into the room easier. Here we have an entryway with some more green stars. So keeping our entryways clear, um, consider wall hooks for coats to get them up out of the way if there's no closet handy. Um, also having baskets or benches plus a place to sit at the entryway. So baskets and benches get the shoes up out of the way and make sure that the entrance itself is as clear as possible. Now, I don't want you to go out and buy furniture and block the door just because you saw it on the slide, right? So we wanna keep in mind ways that we still want to have good access, but we don't wanna clutter that space as well with our things. Okay, Andrew, we're up to the entrance of the house, you're up. <laughs> 
Yeah, for the entryway, I just have one quick note. Fritzi, you had those great examples of not just our own ways of entering the house, but also strollers and the wash machine delivery and things like that. The one thing I want to add is also thinking about if the possibility of emergency personnel needs to come to our home to get us in or out, which would probably also include a gurney that has to come in and out. So you want to make sure that not just your entryway, but all the passageways in your home are not blocked. I've got a pile of books next to my bed that if it falls, it's going to block the doorway. I got to make sure that nothing's <laughs> going to block the doorway to my bedroom to my bathroom, to any of the rooms where I might be if emergency personnel needs to get through with a gurney. Oh, great, great tip. Although I'd be fascinated to see what that stack of books is all about, right? All righty, next is the kitchen. And no matter how many rooms we have in our house, the kitchen is where we congregate. This is another place where slips, right? We accidentally spill some water, we're moving the water, putting the plates into the dishwasher, there's water on the floor, nobody sees it, right? Hard surfaces, slippery surfaces and water, that could be a recipe for disaster. So considering we've got lots of cooks oftentimes in the kitchen as well, we have some safety considerations. Oops, sorry. All right. Among the first uh, includes lots of lighting and adding additional under cabinet lights if we don't have it uh, is one way to do that. Um, there are also lights that are on a tape or ribbon now that you can put at the base of the cabinets that will also, they can, some of them are motion activated. So as you enter, you can have additional lighting near the floor. We want to be able to really access our cabinets. Some of us have those cabinets in the corner into which things fall and we don't know until we move what we lost back in that cabinet. So again, looking at ways to make it easier for ourselves and for anyone who is working and cooking with us in the kitchen, pull out shelves underneath. If we have cabinets that are too high and we are, it's a little troublesome, we can get the shelving inserts that will also drop down and make it easier for us to reach those items. Yeah, here we have more of the appliance opportunities. So again, looking at making things as easy to use, but as safe as possible. So we're gonna start in the middle with the stove. So our cooktop has the controls in the front. That's gonna be a segue to Andrew in a little bit. Our refrigerator is French door style. So the freezer, the heavier items are stored down below, but when you open the doors, we have full access to what is inside the fridge. Um, in addition, over on the right, we've got the microwave mounted at the, on the counter. Right, so instead of having it up overhead, trying to put our food up there and then take the hot food out and bring it down, it is here on the counter. And again, lots of these appliances now are also changing and manufacturers are paying attention to what our needs in the marketplace are. So they even have now microwaves that not only are on the counter, but some are down in the drawer so that we're lifting up, which is an easier process for us. Okay, Andrew, you're up with the kitchen. <laughs> Thank you. As you can imagine, the kitchen is a big zone for me to talk about for fire and burn safety. It's a place that we think, oh, there's a lot of heat there. There's a lot of ways that we can burn ourselves. In fact, 74% of burn injuries for our age group happen in the home and three quarters of those happen in the kitchen or the bathroom. And when we think about burn injuries, there's actually three modes of burn injury, different ways that we can get burned. One is from flame or fire. One is from steam or scald injuries. And one mm. is from contact when you touch something hot. It happens a lot in the kitchen. So I want to look at each of those a little bit. So in the kitchen flame, you know, the saying goes a watch pot never boils, but an unwatched pot on the stove is super unsafe. So you wanna make sure that you are staying by the stove when you're cooking. 
Even if Amazon dropped off a package on the porch and you're just going to run and grab it and come right back, turn your burner off. Your recipe is not going to be ruined. Don't step away from the stove or out of the room if there's a flame going. Another thing when you're cooking, especially around the stove area, and it doesn't matter if it's electric or induction or gas or propane, you want to wear tight fitting sleeves or short sleeves. Not those big long sleeves, which are fantastic for entertaining, but they're not so great for cooking because they're flammable. And you don't want to be reaching for things and stirring a pot on the back burner or something like that with long fabric hanging. And it's not just sleeves that we have to think about. You want to keep all flammables away from the burner area. And some of that stuff is the things we need for cooking. We need wooden spoons, but they're flammable. We need the recipe or the cookbook or the oven mitts or the dish towel. All those things are super important that we need while we're cooking. They just need to be kept away from the stove zone where there's flame or direct heat from other kinds of burners. And then when we think about scald injuries, the second burn type, scald injuries in the kitchen, um, Fire services are going to tell you there's a phrase that they use all the time and they say hot liquids burn like fire. It causes the same kind of burns, the same kind of tissue damage, the same kind of tough recovery that we have if we get burned. So as Fritzi already mentioned, microwave safety is super important, as well as tea kettles and coffee pots and hot pots and um, crock pots and smart pots and all the different things that have a lot of hot liquids in them. You want to make sure that you use both hands when you're moving stuff from one zone to the other. As we get older, our grip may not be what it used to be. Make more trips if you need to. Give yourself permission to not have to be like a waiter in a restaurant juggling four or five things. Make more trips as you need to. And you want to make sure that those trips, those voyages from say, the cooking <laughs> zone to the eating zone is a clear zone before you get started. You don't want to have the pets behind you. You don't want to have a, a gel mat for your comfort while you're cooking with a corner turned up. You want to make sure that there's all kinds of space that is clear so that you can go back and forth to the dining room table or the dining room or the kitchen counter or wherever it is that you're carrying hot liquids or hot items. And then when we think about contact burns in the kitchen, one of the things to focus on, and I love in this picture, there's the, the coffee maker on the counter there. You know, those appliances that have the super short cords and they frustrate the heck out of us because mm -hmm. they're, why would you put a short cord on there? There's those cords are short for a reason. And those are fryers, air fryers, smart pots, crock pots, coffee pots. Those are not supposed to be plugged into surge protectors. They're not supposed to be plugged into mm -hmm. extension cords. They are one plug <clears throat> directly into the wall. They're meant to be short cords. You're not meant to have cords going across for any kind of appliance that generates heat. Also to avoid contact burns, we want to make sure we're using oven mitts that fit well. Sometimes you grab a dish towel and it kind of doesn't get one handle on one side of something. Make sure you take the time to protect your hands using for hot pans, casserole dishes, stuff like that. And you want to try to avoid distraction. As Fritzy said, the kitchen is where everybody hangs out, especially at a party. It's, it's like the one zone that everybody comes in and hangs out, but the cook really needs to focus. And then one last thing that was a lesson that I had to unlearn from my parents and grandparents, if you do burn yourself in the kitchen or anywhere in home, and it's not the level that needs medical attention, you don't have to go to the emergency room or the doctor, but you've burned yourself, the only thing to put on your burn is cool water. No mm. ice. I learned ice. My mom taught me ice. My grandparents taught me ice. No ice. Ice will actually cause more damage to burn tissue. So only cool water. The running water out of the faucet is fine. Put your hand or, or whatever is burned in cool water or under cool water. No lotion, no butter, no peanut butter. These are things that we might have learned a long time ago, but especially no ice. People's instinct is to go straight for the ice, and it actually causes more harm than good. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Those were great tips, and I'm glad you listed butter because that that was family folklore for me. You get a burn. We didn't, we had margarine, but it was the same thing. <laughs> yeah, those are great. Thank you. All righty, the bathroom. Here we go uh, for general safety. Again, uh, we know that this is a space where we have hard surfaces. We have water, we have soap, and we have people. And that combination 
um, even though this man is busy washing his face, can be uh, recipes for disasters. Oh, nice segue since we just left kitchen and recipes. Alrighty, we have some special safety features that we can add to the house. And within the bathroom, again, the general considerations, we wanna make sure that our rugs are down, right? We don't have tripping hazards there. We have adequate lighting. We may have extra lighting uh, for the different functions. And the other piece are, is the use of the grab bars, safety bars, assist bars. So they come in styles and colors and lots of different new accessories are also grab bars. Um, and I'll, they can be installed um, yourself uh, with guidance or installed by professionals. But some of the new ways for us to be able to get this additional support in the bathroom, not only just our wall mounted, but in fact, the soap dish. This is an example of another kind of a grab bar, the toilet paper holder. So if you don't have space, for example, to have a, a bar near the toilet itself, you just change the toilet paper holder to a toilet paper grab bar, and it is designed to provide that support that you need. Again, many of these things require adequate blocking. So really seeking professional um, support for this is a good idea. And please keep in mind that the suction cup grab bars are not safe in our homes. And for some reason, Andrew had ideas about burn safety in the bathroom too. So I'm ready to hear these. <laughs> I absolutely do. You know, you think bathroom, there's water, there's not so much of a danger of getting burned, but you'd be surprised there actually are that we, when we think of them, we're like, oh, of course, that makes sense. So bathrooms, one thing to think about, again, fire injury, fire and, and flame injuries, scald injuries and contact injuries, all of them can show up in the bathroom. One of the things a lot of us do in the bathroom, even though it's coming into spring and warmer weather, it's a place where we have space heaters. And it's also a place where people sometimes have installed wall heaters that have those hot coils like an old toaster or like an old toaster that are in the wall to heat up the bathroom specifically because we don't, it's a terrible place to be cold. Um, those things are okay to have as long as they're rated for wet zones and stuff like that. But you want to make sure that you keep your towels, the clothes that you take off to go in the shower, the clean clothes you're gonna put on, the robe, any of that flammable stuff cannot hang in front of it. That can't be where your towel rack is if you've got a space heater or a wall heater. You gotta keep that stuff at least three feet away from those direct sources of heat. Another thing in the bathroom, some of us use a bathroom as a Zen retreat. It's a bathtub, we soak, we've got candles around the tub. Again, you wanna make sure for stuff hanging near candles and you always wanna make sure that you blow them out when you leave the room, of course. Don't leave a candle burning if you're not in the same space with it. Now for scald injuries, the one thing we wanna think about is our water temperature. So throughout your house, your apartment, if it's something that you have direct control over, your water heater temperature should be set no higher than 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Manufacturers allow them to get a lot hotter, but 120 degrees max, otherwise it can cause tissue damage. And that's for washing your dishes in the kitchen, that's for the bathroom, taking a shower and bathing. It should never be more than 120 degrees. That's plenty hot to cut the grease on your dishes. It's plenty hot to get the dirt off your body. It's hotter than you think, but it should never be more than 120 degrees Fahrenheit. So you wanna make sure that you can set that on your water heater. And that's a, a tank heater, a tankless heater, gas, electric. There are ways to adjust them on all of those. No higher than 120. And you just test, you test like if you're in a hotel even, you test water temperature like you do baby formula on your wrist. It's a very sensitive place. There's a lot of nerve endings there. If it's too hot for your wrist, it's too hot to put your whole body in it. So you just want to make sure that that water temperature is always going to be safe for you. If you take a long bath or a quick shower, it makes no difference. And then contact injuries in the bathroom. 
one of the things that we don't pay, necessarily think about is the stuff that we use for our hair. You can see that I use a lot of these products like a curling iron or a crimper or a hair dryer. Those things stay super hot after you switch them off. A curling mm -hmm. iron or a straightening iron can get up to 425 degrees Fahrenheit, which is just a ridiculous number of degrees to that we're using in our hands and around our heads, but it works for hair. Uh, or so I'm told, but you want to make sure that you never put those things down while they're plugged in or even right after they're plugged in near flammables. Don't put them down on the hand towel. Don't put them down mm. on anything that could catch fire because they will start a fire. And you also want to make sure that you unplug them all the time when you're not using them. Don't leave them plugged in. So those are my, those are my bathroom thoughts. Fabulous. Fabulous. Thank you. And you're absolutely right. Those hair straightening products or the, those appliances, um, now the, some of the manufacturers have new appliance garages with silicone that you can mount inside the cabinets. And, um, but I think it's a, it's a wonderful suggestion to have a safety zone for the hot appliances uh, at, and that then that makes the rest of the space a safety zone for us. So those are, those are great suggestions. Ah, now we have moved to our living spaces. Again, looking at not only for our own family, but for visitors and uh, family coming in general, when we have people around us than some of the spaces, not only the entry into the house, but what else is going on uh, in our living spaces and looking with a different eye toward table lamps, extension cords, uh, those things. So we're gonna take a quick peek here at, again, some green stars, quick on this one, right? The corners of the rug. There's a number of products that are easy to use that are, do not damage the floor. They're almost like the little tiny mini suction cups, almost they operate not like Velcro, but they adhere to the floor and really hold down those corners. Um, and I will tell you personally, I had a rug that was dangerous in one room, so I moved it to another room figuring it wasn't gonna be dangerous there. But when I took the time to actually put the corners down, it was interesting to be able to feel the difference just walking on that rug when those corners were secured. Um, plus, I, it didn't trip anybody, so it was good for everybody. And this photograph and this rendering, the other thing we're looking at here, well, the other green star, right, is for this table lamp, it has to be plugged into the wall some distance away. So here we have covered up that cord. Um, don't put the cords under the rug because as we walk back and forth over it, that could be a problem. And I'm not gonna steal Andrew's thunder here. So within our living spaces, we wanna have adequate space around the furniture to move easily and not have stacks of books perhaps that might tip over and create some uh, disturbance in our walkway here, but make it easy for everyone to get around in the house. And in our living spaces as well, we have our lighting and electrical considerations. Lighting is one of my favorite topics and <laughs> the use of motion sensor lights Nightlight, easy to add on our list, quick fixes. Rocker style switches, where we're going from ones that are a little tricky to manage if, we, if our hands hurt to the rocker styles. And now there are some that are simply touch. And again, back to that smart home, there's some you just, it just knows you're in the room and will go on, right? There are also, besides the switch, the switch plates themselves now, some of them snap on, an old switch plate style can come off and a new one will snap on with little lights underneath. So when it snaps into place, we automatically get some extra lighting. 
and we want to make sure that we have lighting in all of the critical parts of the house, all of our hallways, pathways, and if any of us have stairways. Which leads me to our stairway safety. These include for this sample of the stairs, right? We have some lighting along the stairs here as one way to have lighting, but we do see here switch at the top and switch at the bottom of the stairs. So we do have a way to have this overhead light light up the stairs as well. And handrail along the wall as well. So you want handrails on both sides and you want them to be sturdy. You want them to be installed. And if there's any questions, get them checked and get them replaced. We want the stairs to be as non-slip and as safe as possible. So on the tread surfaces, each of these steps as we step up, right? So we want something that's non-slip there as well. And again, there are lots of choices and many of the new products, the new lighting products, and I described it before the toe kick lighting, you can also just install the lighting along the edge of the stairs and it's motion sensor. So once you step on the first one, you approach it, then the entire stairway will light up. And those are uh, some newer ideas for newer products that are coming out. Interestingly, in our rendering, again, somebody's turned up the corner of this rug, right? So just on our way, right? We did put a lever door handle. We got in here. We kept our furniture to the side, but we had a rug. So we've, we've come through lots of places of the house so far, and there are still more places for us to look. But Andrew, I'm sure you've got living space suggestions for us. I do have a few. When I think about living spaces, I'm also going to add sort of bedroom to that zone. The spaces where you're comfy and cozy, where the big soft furniture is. Um, so for fire safety, one of the things you want to make sure that you're aware of is fireplace safety. If you have a fireplace in your bedroom, in your living room, in your family room, obviously you want screens, glass doors, if it's wood burning, if it's gas. Um, if you, when you go to bed, everything needs to be closed up tight. The gas needs to be turned off completely. Some people that's a switch. Some people it's a key that has to turn. Mm -hmm. That key, you wanna make sure it goes all the way until it's completely off. So there's no small amount of gas coming through. Um, these are also places where additionally people use space heaters, which we talked about before already, and also candles and incense, three feet of distance away from those things. And if you're a smoker, no smoking in bed, We've heard it forever, we know it, um, and also be aware around couches and chairs, and if you use supplemental oxygen, never ever, they never go together. Supplemental oxygen and smoking are, are enemies to each other. Um, for scald injuries in our living spaces, one of the greatest things in the world is get cozy and comfy on your couch with a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, but you wanna make sure you've got a sturdy, flat table surface. You're not balancing <laughs> something on the arm of the couch or on the arm of an easy chair, because that's a, a recipe, speaking of recipes in the kitchen, that's a recipe for a spill and a scald injury. Also, when we think about aches and pains, which, oh boy, we've got them, um, hot water bottles are a great thing that people still use. It's low tech, but it's so comforting if you're not feeling well. But hot water bottles have a rubber, usually a rubberized gasket, and there's a little, the, th the lid screws in down inside the valve area, or it's an outer one that screws on. You just want to make sure that that's not crooked or funky before you lay down and you lay that thing on the side. Because if you lay that thing on the side and that hot water comes out, that's a scald injury waiting to happen. And again, thinking about uh, aches and pains for contact burn injuries, think about heating pads. They're so comforting for muscle aches and, and pains and if we're not feeling great but don't fall asleep with it turned on and the pad should be on top of your body, never underneath you between you and the mattress or you and the couch. What happens is that can heat up to the point of causing a burn injury before you actually notice that it's gotten that hot. So you never lay on top of a heating pad. It's always on top of you and turn it off before you go to sleep. Wow, great. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, we're getting the heads up that we have to speak faster. So I'm going to just say that in the laundry room, 
we have, again, reducing our um, clutter, keeping all of our cleaning supplies, um, looking at when we're making new appliance decisions, uh, looking at front loading machines with front loading controls, just to make it easier in the laundry room. And I'm, I have on my list of cleaning the dryer vent as a safety tip. So that's gonna be my last segue and Andrew is gonna talk really fast. I'm just gonna say yes, clean your dryer vent. And if your hot water heater is here in your laundry room, that's a, just a reminder again to check that 120 degrees maximum. Yes, absolutely, thank you, thank you. Um, all righty, so we've had a chance to look at the green stars for quick fixes. We heard about Andrew's honey-do list for the weekend, but between the combination of some important, really important tips from Andrew and some things here, um, let's put into chat one or two good ideas and it's for this weekend, right? I'm supposed to give you two weeks to go out and do this, but I'm not going to. So for this presentation, think about what is it that you can do this weekend and let's put them into action so that going into next week will be that much safer. All right, let's see what we've got going on. Andrew, Diane, have we, what have we got in chat? Question for you. Okay. What clearance do we need around the water heater? Oh, that's a great question. There's a, most of us have one of two different kinds of water heater. There's the, the tank version, which is the big vertical tank of water that keeps hot. And then there's the tankless, which we think of as on-demand water heaters. The tank version doesn't need a lot of clearance. There's a pilot light in there if it's gas, but it's, all, it's got safety casings around it. Think about it, especially on the, in the east where things get super cold, they even put special blankets around them. So you don't need a lot of clearance for the tank ones. Tank less, which is on demand water heater. There's not, you're not keeping the water hot the whole time and it's running through a super hot zone. That is often gas generated and there's an air vent. So you just wanna make sure that that air vent can let the air out to move through both for efficiency and for safety because the air coming out can be pretty hot. Sometimes those are in a garage or a basement. Sometimes they're outside on the side of the house. Great, thank you. More um, frick, maybe somebody didn't catch. Um, how do you secure the rugs? If you can give them another quick description. Okay, so there are products and there's a, a, a lot of different companies make them. Gorilla Grips is one of them. The folks from the old Gorilla Glue company. <laughs> but Gorilla Glips, Grips come, basically it's a, the part that sticks to the floor and then it has a, an adhesive that will stick to the back of the rug but it will not mar the floor and it won't damage the floor and it will work on lots of surfaces. So that's just one, one example. Um, if you shop online, you can just put in, you know, rug grips and you'll get lots of different products that you can look at and see which one might work best for you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All righty. Uh, here we go. These are resources for us. And I, Tiffany, you can jump right in here if you want. But what's really important for all of you to know is that AARP offers the Home Fit Guide. They now have an app well as well that will let you take pictures inside your house and give you some hints. Um, the AARP Foundation has important information. There are occupational therapists and certified aging in place specialists as well that can help you take a look at these issues in your homes. And there will be much more information about what's going on events near you as well. And in the chat, there are also important connections to Andrew's organization and resources there as well, so that you can get more information about this home safety piece directly as it relates to the burn safety 
and fire safety in your home. So I, I am sure that in the chat, there's lots of links and great information for you. Yes, thank you so much, Fritzy and Andrew. We can give you a quick round of applause just for giving us so much helpful information. Um, I'm already seeing people committing to taking some steps, which is really helpful. And you see the little applause going up. Um, one question was, what do I do with the rug on top of a carpet? And I've heard this in other presentations that you've shared, Fritzy, is sometimes you just got to get rid of that rug because you'd <laughs> rather be safe than um, sometimes for the, the look of it, if that makes sense. Or you can try to um, secure it using the grips um, as well. 